When you see a graph that goes like this, you think something very special happened right about here. And something indeed did. But what makes this chart especially interesting is that it has to do with our material wealth, pretty much all of it, including everything you own. And one of the very few things we can point to for setting off that huge boom is right here in a museum in Paris. I want to show you a lathe today. Now that might not look or sound like something crazy awesome, but stick with me here and see if you agree this is one of the most amazingly important machines ever. And it applies to you and how you live your life. There's also a story of a mechanical duck with unusual abilities, but we'll get to that later. I'm in the Musée des Arts et Métiers, Museum of Arts and Crafts, Paris's temple to science and learning. In a way, this is Paris's MIT that goes back to 1794. If you watched my first video in this series, which you totally should, you know how amazing and unique this institution is. There's thousands of amazing machines here, and I'll talk about some of them in future videos. In that first video in this series, I talked about Vukasan. He's the guy who built the first fully automatic programmable loom, essentially a weaving robot, in the 1750s. But all the glory went to another guy who made minor improvements on it. This is another one of Vukasan's fantastic creations, an all-metal lathe he made in 1751. Now, this is not just any lathe, but possibly the first all-metal lathe with dual V-ways and a carriage and cross-slide driven by screws. With this simple-looking machine, it said that Vukasan defined the principles of the modern lathe as we know it today. Okay, cool, why should I care, I hear you say. Because lathes are, in my opinion, the foundation of the greatest explosion of wealth we've ever seen, and a big part of the story about why we're all not working in a field somewhere. Unless that's your thing, which is totally cool. If you're not familiar with lathes, they spin the workpiece and a cutting tool held in a sliding carriage can shape them, often to make them very accurately round to a specific diameter, but also very smooth. You need very round, smooth parts for machinery, but if you didn't have a lathe to make round parts, it'd be practically impossible to do it by hand, which is why lathes can give you precision parts very cheaply and quickly. Lathes have been around for shaping wood for hundreds or even thousands of years, but because the early lathes were also made out of wood, they are relatively flimsy and not suitable for very accurate work, especially in metal, which needs a very strong, stiff machine to work it. And the cutting tool is held by hand so there's little consistency. There were already small all-metal lathes for clock making for a couple hundred years before this, but they were for making small, delicate parts, not something you build industrial machines with, which is the key difference here. Vukasan's lathe was ahead of its time by at least 50 years, and set the pattern for lathes even as we see them today. Maybe not in overall appearance, but definitely in function. It's the first fully documented all-metal lathe with a slide rest, and I consider it to be the first modern lathe. There may have been others which had some or all of these elements previously, but they're lost to history, so we can only speculate. The carriage on this machine moves on two prismatic ways, the inverted V-shape, put together with the cross slide that held the cutting tool that can move in and out very precisely, and we have a very modern looking lathe. There's even what looks like an early tool bit insert. When Vukasan was the inspector for silk factories in Lyon, he realized he needed improved rollers for their mills. The heavy copper rollers were used to crush the silk and give it the moiré pattern that was popular at the time. These rollers were made of copper and there was no way the wooden lathes of the day could turn them accurately, so he invented this machine. This lathe surely added another decimal place in precision, at least. And every time you can add another decimal place, you can kick off huge changes. Let me show you what I mean. Back to the graph from the beginning. This is a chart of worldwide per capita income. From year zero until the 1800s, the line is pretty flat with almost no growth. You can actually send that flat line back about another 5,000 years to the point where humans invented farming. So for about 7,000 years, income was about $400 to $550 per person per year in constant $1990 worldwide. Even as the population grew, there was no growth in income because the productivity of a person was offset by the cost to keep that person alive. In times when there was economic surplus, it was quickly consumed with more births. No matter how much the population grew, we were pretty much always running in place, income-wise. Your average person in 1600 was no better off economically than someone thousands of years earlier. This is what is called the Malthusian Trap. 
and for 7,000 years it was inescapable no matter what we did, until machine tools like this one changed everything. If you look at where the uptick starts, you see it's a bit later than the 1751 of this lathe. That's when these early machine tools started to have a cascading effect. With tools like these, and the other precise industrial machines they made, suddenly one person could produce what it used to take many people to do. And for the first time, we could make enough surplus that we could outpace births. Each time a new machine tool adds another decimal place of accuracy, precision gets cheaper, which makes new products and processes possible, and far-reaching booms of economic growth kick off, and Vukasan's lathe represents one of those moments. Soon, someone modified a lathe that was used for boring cannons to instead make the smooth cylinders needed for steam engines. And then between the steam engines powering factories and steam locomotives moving raw material to factories and then goods to market, the line starts to go nearly vertical in the greatest increase in wealth we've ever seen. Here's why it happened. Imagine you have a small town with only farms, and then someone builds a factory in town which multiplies the workers' efforts with machines. Some people will leave the farms to work in the factory. Others will leave the farms to do things like build the roads, canals, or railroads the factory needs. The factory also needs carpenters, blacksmiths, and machinists. Power from coal and machinery from iron means miners now have lots of work. The factory brings in money which is distributed to the workers via wages. Now they could do something new and exciting like buying things rather than making them for themselves which kicks off other, entirely new industries which have nothing directly to do with the farm or factory, but cater to this new class of people with money, which creates other new people who could spend money, which repeats this cycle of growth. And that's why you don't work on a farm. Unless you do, which is cool. Thank you. This also meant there was a lot of money around, but not enough workers, which means workers' wage started to go up. Remember the graph? But what about the few people left on the farms? You bring automation from the factories to the farm to multiply the farmer's labor. This is why we have things like tractors and combines. It's no accident the first tractors were giant lumbering steam engines that were basically the factory steam locomotives with wheels. And that's what blows my mind so much about this lathe. It's a very tangible artifact that lit the fuse of probably the greatest boom in income and prosperity we've ever seen. The very silk weaving machines this lathe was helping to make are some of the very first machines in a factory which stopped us from running in place and got us out of that Malthusian trap. And this led to real change in people's lives. But all this new wealth the machines created didn't solve all of our problems. In fact, it created new ones. Nor was the wealth evenly distributed. This incredible period of rapid growth fascinates me as for the first time people could see the world changing around them. Old ways were falling away and something new was happening, significant change within a person's lifetime. These machines just didn't bring us new wealth. They also completely changed how we think. The very name for this channel, Machine Thinking, speaks to this exact period when that line in the chart just starts to turn upward noticeably. It comes from a quote in Jonathan Hale's excellent book, The Old Way of Seeing. It reads, In 1828, the Fouts legend obsessed artists and writers. In dozens of works, they told the story of the modern predicament. In gaining the power of industry, the world was sacrificing its soul. It was not the new machines themselves they feared. There were not yet many. It was machine thinking. The name isn't about artificial intelligence, or that I enjoy thinking about how machines are put together. Well, I do enjoy that too. But rather how we make machines, and how when those machines give us new abilities, those machines in turn make us. When you introduce new technology, whether it's a computer in your pocket giving you instant access to the world's knowledge, or a cheap car suddenly available to the masses, which let people travel freely for the first time, which changed everything. The way you even think is changed by those machines just being there, and you're a different person for it. And of course, how we think about machines themselves is important. The things required to build that first lathe were lying around for centuries in various parts of the world, but it took a new way of thinking about machines to put them to use in a special way which led to that huge boom in growth. Like the people mentioned in the quote, we too can see ways of change coming, and our reaction isn't always good. We'll talk more about that another time. So for me, looking at this lathe, it doesn't just represent the vast wealth and social changes that was to come, but also a huge shift in how we think. Consider what we do with lathes today. Many are computer controlled, making parts in a highly automated way with all their functions carefully programmed. 
And remember who made the first highly automated programmable machine? Vukasan. It'd be almost another 200 years before we'd start to stick lathes together with that level of automation, and it would take the additional efforts and innovations of countless people. The first programmable machine tools even used punch tape. But now parts of products we use every day are made cheaply and quickly this way. Vukasan's machines show clearly at an early point in the Industrial Revolution the French were doing very well indeed. But their version of machine thinking didn't allow for the mass adoption of industrial tools and processes like it soon did in England. England is rightfully so most closely associated with the Industrial Revolution, and their contributions are innumerable, and for a time their output was second to none. But even the English version of machine thinking could not match that of what was yet to come, the Americans. We use machine tools in a way so unique that it bears our name, the American system of manufacturing. But now it's used the world over. Not that the idea was ours, though. Again, it was a Frenchman, Honoré Leblanc, who first had the idea but was unable to implement it in France. But he told the American ambassador, Thomas Jefferson, about it, who brought it back to the U.S. where things went bananas. In America, where labor was relatively scarce, putting the knowledge and precision into the machines rather than a highly skilled workforce made a ton of sense. And it took off like wildfire. Interchangeable parts, division of labor, assembly lines, and more quickly made America an incredibly productive nation. But these are all subjects for another time. If you'll grant me, that initial huge explosion in wealth is largely the result of machines and factories. And those machines were built by machine tools. And the foundation of machine tools is lathes, and Vukasan's lathe is considered to be one of the first truly industrial lathes, you can understand why it's so cool that we have it right here. So for me, this is why I consider Vukasan's lathe to be the machine that made everything. Is it literally the machine that the entirety of our modern industrial world comes from? Of course not. There are plenty of other machine makers and innovators too, especially in England, but they came a little later, and here's a case where France had the lead early on. But because of what it did, and that it did it so early, and that we have it right here as proof. If I do have to pick one machine to represent the machine that made everything, I pick this one. And that's why it's so cool, it's just sitting here quietly in a Paris museum. We saw in the first video of Vukasan's 1750 weaving machine that completely changed the textile industry. And now his lathe, which is an important part of early machine tool history, which kicked off that explosive growth. But amazingly, that's not even what he's most famous for. That would be a mechanical duck that could poop. Let me explain. Before he made the lathe or weaving machine, he was renowned for making automata, essentially mechanical clockwork robots reputed to have amazing abilities. Automata, like this musical elephant from the 1770s, were all the rage with royalty and the wealthy, and the wealthy paid huge sums for them, and they would go on tours charging admission to be seen. The more complicated, novel, or magical they were, the greater the prestige, and Vukasans were some of the best, and it made him very famous. One was a life-sized shepherd flute player which used bellows to blow air through the lips of the automata and could correctly finger the notes for 12 different songs. Another was a kind of drum player. But the final, and considered his masterpiece, was the duck. The duck reportedly would look around, flap its wings, made of 400 parts each, appear to eat and drink, but that's not all. After eating, it would appear to digest the food and defecate onto a silver plate. And that made the duck very famous indeed. After seeing it, the famous philosopher and writer Voltaire was moved to write, perhaps wryly, without Vukasan's duck, you would have nothing to remind you of the glory of France. It turns out to have been a ruse, though. Years later, when closely examined, it was discovered this was a mechanical sleight of hand and the waste was coming from a separate compartment and not really being digested. These photographs were reportedly found in the archives of the museum and may show the duck's mechanism, but there's debate if this is really Vukasan's duck. Vukasan eventually tired of his machines and sold them, and sadly they've all now been lost. Thankfully, we still have many other things he made. His weaving machine or lathe would have been enough to earn him a place in history, but he did so much more. He truly has earned the statue of him here, or that the street in front of the museum is named in his honor. Though he died before this institution was founded, his collection of machinery would become one of the main initial seeds of this entire museum. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.